Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Jeffrey Robson here, um, and I'm hosting our first live YouTube slash Zoom masterclass with Detroit Symphony Orchestra cellist Jeremy Crosmer, who I think most of you know was uh, supposed to supposed to be with us, I guess, a couple of weeks ago now for um, for for. Um, a guest artist residency. And so this is our online version of the masterclass that Jeremy was going to give for, for youth orchestra cellists. And so um, I'm gonna give you a look at Jeremy here just for a second. Give us a wave, Jeremy, yes. And, um, and, and we're going to, I'll be keeping time. And what I would like all the students to do when it's your turn is to um, just say your name and um, and what piece you're going to be playing, and then each of you will have about 15 minutes to um, play and then be coached by be coached by Jeremy. So I hope your friends and family are watching on our YouTube live stream as we get going here, um, and we're going to kick things off with Anna. And like I said, for Carlos, who I see has joined us now. Hey, Carlos. Hey. Um, just sit back and relax if it's not your turn to play yet and just listen to everyone else and the wise words of advice that Jeremy is going to be giving. And um, and we'll go from there. I will just sort of step back and I'll be moder moderating um, moderating the the view that everyone will have on the live stream and we'll go from there. So. Um, Anna and Jeremy, I'm going to unmute you both now. And um, Carlos, I'm gonna mute you for now. Okay. Um, and go ahead, I guess now, Anna, with, with, your, with your piece and don't forget to introduce what you're playing. Okay, yeah, so um, my name is Anna. And I will be playing Sonata Number no. One in E Minor by Johannes Brahms.
Hi, Anna. Anna, thank you so much. That's great. Since we got to the recap, I thought we would go back and talk about what you played. That was really great. Um, can you tell me how long you've been working on the piece and whether you've had a chance to play it with piano? Um, I have not had a chance to play it with piano yet. I was planning on playing it with piano accompaniment um, for this masterclass, but I wasn't ever able to get together with my pianist, obviously, because of um, COVID. Um, I've been working on this for not very long, <laughs> um, probably like two months, two, three months maybe, but I've also had other repertoire on the, on my radar. So. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's in really good shape and I'm especially proud of what you did with the chords. Um, it's hard for me to tell over Zoom, but I can see your left hand uh, and it looks really great. Um, so that's something you should be proud of. I know that's really difficult for a lot of people. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is getting a bigger expression out of what you're doing. Um, again, a lot of it's different on Zoom, so it's hard for me to tell. But one thing I've noticed when you're performing even for live um, is that what you feel like you're doing expressively is never as much as what people hear. So there's always this barrier. It's, it's kind of like the fourth wall or something um, where you're on stage or you're in your home and there's the computer screen or there's the, you know, whatever invisible wall is between the audience and you on stage, right? Um, for me, I like to think of things very technically. So even though I said we're going to talk about expression, there's, um, there's real steps that you can take to make your expression more prominent. Um, so think of it like uh, operatic people. Um, if you've ever seen, seen an opera singer up close, like right before they're performing or right after, you might notice that they wear a ton of makeup, like way too much makeup. And if you're standing two feet from them, it looks um, terrible. But when you're looking out from the audience and you see that much makeup, you really, it really, um, it highlights the facial expressions that they're trying to make. Um, so if they put more makeup around their eyes and their eyes look wider um, from the audience, you can really see that. So what does that mean in terms of cello playing? Um, I think that you just need to exaggerate everything that you're doing, um, especially in this piece. So this piece has a lot of swells in it, right? 
Um, some of them are marked and some of them are, are not marked. Um, the beginning, it's just, it's in waves, like the da, 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 da. Everything goes up and down. Um, so I did bring my cello. Uh, the sound is probably not gonna be great, but let me show you a little bit of what, what I was thinking. Right, so that E going to the F sharp, you can really do a lot more in terms of growth. And then you keep growing and the rest of that phrase, it grows and grows and grows until the high point. Um, now I have a question for you. Where do you think the high point is in that first phrase? Um, probably on, I would say the C. The D? Or sorry, yeah. Well. How about, and yeah. you, how about you just show me what you're thinking? So play the first phrase. Good. Can you go can you go four more bars? Can you say that one more time? For bars, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, you can think of it either way. I was thinking eight bars. So the, um, the high notes at the end of the eight bars, the F sharp and the G, if you can really make a big deal out of those, that would be great. So. <laughs> that second set of four bars. Okay. Sorry, were you wanting to start from the beginning again or? Maybe start from bar five. trying to get my very <laughs> To me, it's a more feminine color, like something maybe lighter and more, um, more serene and tranquil. Um, what I would do is be really careful that your vibrato uh, doesn't turn on and off, but that you have one that's consistent, okay? So um, having a consistent vibrato will help you lead the phrase where you want it to go. Um, the moment that you stop the vibrato, then whatever note you stopped it on suddenly stands out, okay? So see, even if you have a slower vibrato or something that's very narrow, it does, as long as you're using a little bit of vibrato on each note, uh, then you can preserve the phrase. So let's go all the way from the C to the high C, all the way to these three Cs.
Good. So when you're playing faster notes, make sure that the vibrato still continues through them. The way that you can do this is instead of thinking about vibrato from your hand, think about your elbow opening and closing. Can you just practice opening and closing your elbow? So this is like when you shift from first position to fourth position, right? You see that elbow is making that motion. If you're making that motion here, then it doesn't matter which finger you're putting down, you'll still have the vibrato. So you can, if it, go ahead and do this with me while I'm talking. You can change your finger and you can keep the vibrato consistent. So try switching to a different finger while you're vibrating. Just try each, each finger in turn. Yeah, good. And so at the end of the note, right before you switch fingers, you wanna keep the vibrato going, right? Um, it's a temptation to stop the vibrato so you can get the next finger ready. Try not to do that. So where I noticed that you stopped the vibrato was on the D, E, and F sharp triplet. The I heard this. Try to keep it through. Can you play that phrase one more time? And also before you start, can you move your stand a little bit to your left? So then we can all see your hand. Is that Good. better? Yep. Okay. experiment, what we're going to do is we're going to lift our hand so that you're touching the string, but you're not pressing the string down. Okay. And when you vibrate, I want you to move at least one half step back and forth on each note. It's going to sound really terrible. And over Zoom, it's going to sound even worse. But this is a technique that I use to practice consistent vibrato. So I'll play it first and it will be forever immortalized on YouTube and then it'll be your turn. So something like this. Does that make sense? I think so. <laughs> okay, think opera singer. <laughs> That's fine, yeah. That's something that you can practice on your own. And when you do that, focus on relaxing your hand, okay? Um, and don't worry about the pitch so much. It's more about being able to keep the vibrato when you switch from one note to the other. So again, when you are preparing to shift or preparing to move to another note, you wanna keep the vibrato so that your phrase can continue all the way through. Okay, good. Um, can we start at the high three notes? give you one more technique thing that'll help you with your expression. Um, when you get to the end of your bow on, an, on a down bow and you're switching bows out here, um, you might need to dig in a little bit more to get the sound to be um, more, uh, less diffuse and more concentrated, okay? So at the end of the phrase, when you're getting ready to go to the next one, um, you use a little bit more pressure and a little bit less speed. So right here. That way 
way your bow is in the string all the time. So you're never lightening up, okay? Can you try that phrase one more time and then we'll be done. Great. And um, one thing that'll help you with that is when you get to the tip, if you pivot a little bit more, you have your elbow just a little bit higher, it'll help you get dig in more. You don't want to do it too much. I try not to pivot too high. So um, just practice that and experiment and see what helps you get the most power. I've seen people play like this before and it, it can be pretty damaging. So you don't want to do that, but you also don't want to be too low. If you think about water flowing down your arm like a waterfall and you have a good consistent curve to your arm, um, then that'll help you get the energy that you need to the bow. Rather than if it's too high, then the water's just going to spray off in front of you. And if it's too low, then the water collects in a pool around your elbow and just falls off the side, right? We can talk about that more when we have other people play. But it's really nice to hear you, Anna. Um, looking forward to everyone else. Um, and did everyone get my message about the sound settings? So good, good, okay, great. Thank you so much. Who's next? Great, so we have Michael Bridges is next and he'll introduce his piece. Great job, Anna. We're all clapping for you over, over the internet here. Um, so, and really nice things to say, Jeremy, so thank you. So I'm going to um, unmute Michael and mute Anna and, uh, and toss it over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Michael. I will be playing the prelude to Box Second Suite. <laughs> Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much, Michael. Um, how long have you been working on this piece? Um, about two weeks. Great, it's, yeah, it's in really good shape. Now, uh, were you able to edit your audio settings? I don't think so. Okay, let me see. Can, can all of you raise your hand if you tried to edit the audio settings? Let's try doing it together. Um, so by the microphone um, option to mute, or there should be a way to go to your settings for your audio settings. Can everyone look for that? If you're on a desktop and it's on the bottom row of options, there's a little sort of wedge carrot looking thing next to the mute button that if you click on that, a menu will come up um, where you can select your audio settings. Is, is anyone able to find it? Raise your hand if you were able to find the audio settings. Good, good, three, good, great. Um, okay, so you've clicked on audio settings. Uh, is there an option to go to an advanced menu? Do you see a button that says advanced? Oh yeah, I can just share my screen. <laughs> You're gonna see all of my crazy desktop. Let's see. Not quite sure how to do this. <laughs> I don't think I can share my what the part of my screen I want to share. Um, so, did anyone have the advanced button on their audio settings? Raise your hand if you had it. Okay, some of you, and some of you don't. That's fine. Um, so there should be something that says audio processing, suppress persistent background noise or suppress intermittent background noise. If it's possible for you to disable those, then go ahead and do that. So it's set to auto and you should set it to disable. And th this is probably useful the more Zoom meetings you do or if you're having Zoom lessons, um, you wanna try to do this with your microphone because um, what the noise suppression does is if it hears a little bit too much noise, um, you might want to keep the echo suppression on if you can, but the noise one, if, if it hears too much noise, it'll automatically turn your microphone down. And so if you're playing like a really loud passage of Bach, it'll automatically turn it down when it thinks it's too loud, which you don't want you don't it to want do. <laughs> Was anyone able to make that change? I okay. Find you couldn't find it? No. Okay, then don't worry about it. Um, I Let's continue and, and not worry about it for now. Um, great. So I really enjoyed the Bach. I, I think you are doing a great job from what I can tell of the louds and softs. And I think that's especially true because Zoom was making the loud parts a little bit quieter, which means that you have a really wide range of dynamics. So that's really great. Um, I wanna give you some exercises with the bow because what I noticed from what I can see with your bow hand is that you're holding the bow pretty tight most of the time. And, um, and there's ways to be more flexible that are going to help you out with um, getting a better sound out of your instrument. Okay, so these are some basic exercises and uh, I use these with all of my students, regardless of how old they are and I do them myself. So uh, we start with the first one, hold the bow and everyone else who's watching, you can do this too. Hold the bow in both hands. And now I want you to take your right hand above the bow and just hold the bow with the left hand, take the right hand and do sort of jellyfish with your hand. So the idea behind this is you're pushing down with your fingers and then you're pulling your fingers up into the palm of your hand, right? And so this is about using all of those um, uh, joints in your fingers, right? Good, yeah, and you can move your arm a little bit too. Um, and it's also important if you can separate this wrist motion with the finger motion. So right now we're just doing fingers, extending the fingers and pulling them up, right? Good, I see everybody doing that, that's great. 
Now this, this is the first jellyfish exercise. The second jellyfish exercise is to grab the bow with the right hand and do exactly the same thing. So you're still holding it in your left hand, but now you've got the bow in your right hand and you're pushing down and then pulling back up. And again, you just want to extend your fingers and pull your fingers back into the palm of your hand, right? And if you notice your bow rocking back and forth like this, that's good. Got it? And so that's the second jellyfish exercise. The third one you need your cello for. So uh, let's review one. Everybody do the first one with me. And then the second one, you hold the bow. And the third one, you have your bow on the string. So this time, take away your left hand. And with the right hand, you're going to do exactly the same thing. So I hope you can see it on, on my camera. When you pull the bow up, your bow should move over to the A string. And when you extend your fingers, the bow should go down to the D or the G string. I don't think it's possible to get it all the way across all the strengths, but you just practice that. So this will improve the flexibility of your bow hand. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions on those exercises? If so, raise your hand so I can see you. Good. Okay. So uh, a piece like Bach that's very, very lyrical. Uh, this is going to help you with your phrasing. Okay, so whenever you get to the end of a bow and you have a bow change, what happens is that there's a tiny bit of lag time where your bow changes bows from down bow to up bow, but your hand is still going in one direction, right? So you have this sort of arc that happens on this side of the bow. And then when you get to here, it's the same thing. So you need to have this flexibility. Um, if you have no flexibility, when you go back and forth, it'll sound a little bit robotic because you'll get the sound stopping between each note. So in order to keep the notes as smooth as possible, to be able to have that flexibility in your right hand, okay? Now, all of that is an exaggeration. What I've shown you on the screen and the practice method, that's an exaggeration of what actually happens. So you wanna be careful that you don't overdo it when you're practicing, because um, everything can look really floppy. Uh, but the more you practice this exercise on its own, the more your practice is going to have this flexibility. Okay, so would you mind playing from the beginning one more time, Michael, and I might cut you off after a few bars. <laughs> give you another exercise because I, I really do like the technique of your left hand and I love the expression you're getting. Um, this is just another exercise for the bow because I think that that's what you should focus on for the next couple of weeks. Okay, and you might have seen this one before. So everyone else can participate in this one too. We did the three jellyfish exercises. This one is the spider exercise. So you hold your bow vertically and you just climb Make sure that your bow doesn't hit your cello. You climb all the way to the top of your bow. This is actually the easy one, okay? Yeah, good. And this is about getting your fingers to be more flexible. Now we have to climb backwards. 
This is the hard one. Good, how many of you have done this before? Raise your left hand if you've done it before. You might have done it many, many years ago. Good, I can see some of you have done it. Um, we don't do this often enough. And especially, you know, when you're playing really aggressive music, like if you play a lot of Shostakovich and youth orchestra or something, then um, you, your hand can get really tight. So we actually have to do this one again because there's another step to it. So this time I want you to do exactly the same exercise, but I want you to make sure your bow is always vertical and never um, twisting around like this. It's really difficult. So see how, if you can keep your bow straight up and down the entire time that you go and the less wobbling you have, the better. So again, going up is pretty easy and then coming down there's so much wobbling and you can look at your frog or you can look at your tip and you can practice keeping it from wobbling. Okay. Yeah, Michael's got the hang of it. That's really good. And I can tell when you're doing this, your fingers are getting more and more flexible because you started and most of the time they were extended like this and you're, you're actually doing a much better job of, um, of opening and closing those joints as you do this. So you're seeing immediate results. That's great. Um, I would do all of these exercises every day, um, maybe three or four times a day. So find a different point during the day, um, just pull out your bow. Don't even worry about having your cello nearby um, and just do them at different intervals. Um, it, it'll take you maybe two or three minutes or maybe five minutes, depending on how dedicated you are. But in one week, you're going to see a lot of positive results with um, the bow going back and forth. Good. Uh, anyone have any questions about that? Good. I want to do one more passage. Uh, can we start from the low F where you left off so we can do this long crescendo? Phrasing you do is great and you it's I like how you pick individual notes to emphasize um, right where we stopped you were doing it on every beat and I think it could be a little more interesting if sometimes you keep the beats moving rather than picking every single beat to do that so this passage <laughs> You can think of it like you were going up and up and up the roller coaster and you got to the top and then now just let things keep going for a little while and don't worry about making all the notes have emphasis. Um, when you're thinking about phrasing in Bach, you have the small phrases in every single bar and then you have the overall phrase. So when you're focused on just on the small phrases, then the overall one um, can get lost. And the opposite is also true. So I sometimes focus too much on the big phrasing and then it just sounds like you're rambling, you know, cause this piece has almost only 16th notes in it. Um, and a lot of the preludes and currants and alamans have almost all 16th. So it can get pretty monotonous. Uh, I like that you were finding those notes to emphasize but I think you can be more creative with which ones that you pick. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Good. Um, it's nice to hear you. Uh, great job. Let's give you a round of applause too. Silent applause. Everyone on YouTube is cheering. Great. Thanks, Michael. Who's next? Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Michael. Great job, and thanks for those exercises. The 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 spider one is is quite tricky. Um, this, <laughs> so um, next we have Carlos Campanor, and um, I will unmute you now, and I will mute Michael, and uh, just go ahead and introduce yourself and your piece. Um, I'm Carlos, and I'm playing a Leggy by Gabriel Farre. <laughs>
Great job. Thank you so much. Uh, so how long have you been working on this piece? Uh, about a month. Good. And have you played it with a pianist? No, I haven't. Okay, good. Uh, it's really solid for only having worked on it for a month. So that, that's great. Um, before we do anything else, can you play this passage again? <laughs> So that second one, you have to be really careful because the accidentals carry throughout the bar. So the first time it's D naturals, but that second one, there are D flats the entire uh, passage. So. Can you try that second one again? It's better. There were a few other notes too. So make sure you look through that one. And then the next one, there should be an A flat the entire time. Rather. Got it? Good. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about intonation and some exercises you can practice that will help with your intonation. Um, I almost asked you if you do your scales every day, but I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I just want to let all of you know that I actually do my scales every day. I usually get through um, 12 out of the 24. And in the very least, you should be doing the scales for the keys of the pieces that you're working on. So this piece, um, Carlos, can you tell me what key this piece is in? Um, e flat major. Good. And what's the minor key for that? Uh, C, C minor. C minor. Yes. So it's in C minor and um, the middle section is in A flat major, even though there's no key signature change. So you should practice a C minor scale. Maybe practice all of them. If you know the harmonic, natural and melodic minor scales, practice all three. If you only know one of them, that's fine too. Um, and practice the A flat major scale, okay? Yeah. So even though that's not listed in, in the key signature, make sure you're practicing that one. E, e flat wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> um, and practice them very slowly with no vibrato, okay? And if you have a tuner, you can set the tuner on the music stand and have it on um, so that it's checking every note that's, um, it, it might be a little bit of overkill, but I would still recommend doing that. Okay. Um, if you have a drone, so if your tuner can play a note for you, or then you can turn that on to E flat or to C and have that going. If your tuner can't do that, one thing that you can do is you can go to YouTube and you can type in cello drone C. And I'll put that in the chat for everyone. Um, in case okay. you don't hear it. Like if you type that into YouTube, then it'll come up with a video that is like either five minutes of just a cello playing their open C string or um, maybe an hour long. There might even be a 10 hour version of it or something. And that way you can play along to it. You can pl practice your uh, piece. You can practice the elegy to it or you can practice your scales to it. Okay. Um, that's very important right now uh, for you because I think your relative pitch is pretty good, but if your hand slips slightly, then you go out of tune and then all of the notes are out of tune, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so your hand position is actually really solid. You have all the half steps are in the right place. When you do the extensions, it looks really good. But like I said, if you accidentally move, just a little bit, then all of the notes end up being off. So that's those are a couple strategies for your intonation practice. Another one that you can do is you can practice with your open strings as drones. This is kind of hard to get used to, but if you play the beginning of this piece with the open strings, 
the second note you play should be in tune with your open D. So it'll sound like this. Yes. Good. And uh, so you can use the open strings as a drone. You can also practice by adding another double stop. And this will make your life much more difficult, but it's worth it. So uh, you use exactly the same fingering. But then if you have a free finger, you put it down on a different string. So here's an example of that. <laughs> So I'm doing exactly the same fingering, but if, um, if one of my fingers is not being used, I'm putting it on the other string. And the more you do it, you'll find notes that kind of fit the key that sound good. Um, and you can use those. Okay. Yeah. Now you may have noticed when I was doing this, uh, I did, I was doing two things differently than when I performed. One, I was using no vibrato. Okay. So when you practice intonation, you the vibrato actually gets in the way and some people even use vibrato to disguise their bad intonation so when you're practicing intonation make sure that you don't vibrate at all and then the other thing i was doing was playing very very slowly okay that'll give you time to notice if a note is out of tune and make the correction before you continue okay it may take you 20 minutes to get through elegy one time with this intonation practice, but it's worth it. You'll only have to do it maybe 10 times and then you'll, it'll be much better. So what it, can anyone do the math for me? That's three hours and 20 minutes of your life spent on intonation for this piece. Okay. <laughs> um, but trust me, it's definitely worth it. Okay. Um, Okay, can you try, you can pick whether you want to do the open string one or if you want to try the double stop one, but can you try it at the beginning once just to make sure that, um, that you understand? Yeah. When a note is out of tune, don't move to the next note until you've fixed it. So here's, I only heard one out of tune note. It was this one. So four notes from the end of that phrase. Uh, can you start where the E flat is? The important thing is there's no rush and that time you gave enough time to fix that note before you continued. And, um, it's a test of patience, but patience is a virtue that all of us need. So it'll improve your intonation and your patience at the same time. Uh, so that's definitely worth it, right? Um, good. And then one other, you still need to train yourself not to vibrate at all when you're doing that exercise. And then what I also want you to do, because I don't want you to do no vibrato ever, is practice the same exercise we were talking about with Anna uh, to improve your vibrato and relax your left hand, okay? So right now your vibrato is pretty fast and tight 
And for this piece, that works for the loud sections, but for the quiet sections, you want something that's more relaxed. So the way to practice that, again, is to do the weird thing where you allow the hand to move like you're shifting. Okay, so it, it sounds really great with this piece, actually. <laughs> Right, it sounds like a recording from the 1950s or something that has been through a lot of tape manipulations. Um, okay, so you, if you can relax your left hand, that gives you a lot more flexibility in your expression because then you can choose when you want something to be really tense or if you want it to be um, more lyrical and expressive. Okay? Yeah. Good. So um, intonation work and vibrato work, and then making sure that you check those notes in the middle section. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you so much, Carlos. Yay, the crowd went wild. Round of applause. All right, thank you. Great job, Carlos. Really, it's nice to so nice to hear everybody play, and um, and so we have next we have um, uh, uh, Dia Chakraborty, who is a member of the Prelude Orchestra, which is one of the um, one of the member groups of the ASO Youth Ensembles, and I'm so glad you are joining us to play. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now, and. Um, and if uh, you would like to tell us what piece you're going to play, that would be fabulous. My name is Dia, and I'm going to be playing the Bach Prelude from the Unaccompanied Symphony.
Great job. Thank you so much. So Dia, can you tell me how long you've been working on this piece? Uh, I'd say for about a few months. Okay, good. Yeah, it's in good shape. Um, is this one of your favorite pieces? Um, I, I don't know enough to say that it's my favorite, but I would say it's one of the most uh, challenging pieces that I ever played. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I agree. It's a very difficult piece. And one of the reasons it's difficult is that it's all 16th notes the entire time, right? And I also There's... tried to do a small little retardando at some places. Uh-huh, yeah, I heard that. That was great. Um, yeah, you're doing a great job with it. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. And I just want to let you know, I'm going to try to demonstrate too. But if the sound is not very good over Zoom, then you can actually go and listen to my recording of this on YouTube. I put it up, I think, about a week ago, um, since I wasn't able to come to Arkansas to do the recital that I was supposed to do. So later on, if you want to listen to this, you can um, hear my, my version of it. But um, you're in really good shape. So I want to talk to you about the left hand first. When you are playing and you're crossing all of these strings and playing on different strings all the time, one thing that will help you once you get it faster is if you have all four of your fingers ready to go all the time. So you know at the, in the first bar, the first two bars, you're only using the first and second fingers. 
I want you to have your, your third and fourth finger over the strings as if they're getting ready to play. I see your third finger's over. Can you get your fourth finger? Yep, exactly. So now, now all four fingers are ready to go. And now can you put all four of them on the D string and push down? Good. Now I want you to lift your fourth finger and now lift your third finger, lift your second and lift your first. Good, and so now all the fingers are ready to go. This is gonna allow you to be faster because if you have your fingers off to the side, um, then it takes a few extra milliseconds to get them where they need to be, right? And I think you'll wanna play this a little faster eventually, like maybe this speed. <laughs> right and so you'll need to have all of those fingers ready at all times so while you're playing i want you to think about that and let's start at the beginning and i'm going to stop you somewhere through so let's focus on the left hand first so uh, should i do it at the speed that you that you showed you can we can try it a little bit faster than what you did. That's great. Good. Um, hopefully that felt like you had your fingers ready to go and they were more accessible. Um, I recommend you think about that a lot because there were a couple places where you forgot and your fourth finger was curled too much and it was out of the way. But, but almost all the bars, you had your fourth finger ready to go and your third finger ready to go. So that's great. So the other thing I wanna to talk to you about is with the right hand. Okay, and this is true for a lot of us. Um, when we play, sometimes the, oh yeah, good, good for you doing that spider exercise. Uh, that's great. Yeah, keep working on that one. Um, I think your hand in general is pretty flexible. I would still do that because it's a fun exercise and it'll keep improving your flexibility. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the contact point. Okay, so what you might notice is that sometimes when you play, the sound will get a little bit scratchy or it might get a little bit fuzzy, right? Um, and you wanna be able to have a consistent sound throughout. And so what's happening is sometimes your bow is moving so that it's too high up the string or it's too close to the bridge. And yeah, you wanna be able to go straight back and forth exactly like you're doing. I think you're capable of doing it but Bach is making it really challenging because he's adding in all of these string crossings from the G string to the D string to the A string. And it's really hard to keep your bow in the same place when you're crossing all of those strings, right? Good, so that's something that you need to focus on. And what I would do to focus on it is listen to your sound really carefully and start to notice. If you notice it's getting scratchy, if it sounds like it's Ponticello, which means close to the bridge, then make that adjustment and move it a little bit away from the bridge. And if you find that your sound is getting really fuzzy, then try moving a little bit closer to the bridge. Um, what happens is when you pull the bow and you get closer and closer to the tip, then 
Um, sometimes the, the bow is moving too far to the fingerboard. So you, you just want to keep it straight back and forth. So one thing that I do as an exercise, and you're already doing it air bowing, but let's try it on the string, is to do uh, a long D string. So we're going to go all the way from the frog to the tip on the D string, and then from the tip back to the frog. Can you try that? Good, and now I want you to go around this speed. So I'm gonna click um, quarter notes at 60, and I'm gonna do, I'll show you exactly what I want you to do, two beats in each direction. And so it'll sound like this. Good. Can you try that? Great. And so this next one is fun. Um, you're going to do the exact same thing, but you're going to get to the tip as quickly as you can within those two beats. And then you're going to get back to the frog on the next two beats as quickly as you can. So it sounds like this. Listen once. And keep your bow on the string when you do it. So you just want to move the bow really fast. Can you try that? I'll try. Great. And so focus on keeping the sound um, as consistent as possible. And um, if you hear it getting fuzzy by the end of the note, then you know that you've moved a little bit too close to the fingerboard. Can you try it one more time that same way? Good. So I want you to practice both of those exercises um, where you do two beats for the down bow and two beats for the up bow. And the first time you're doing the bow for all two beats. And the second exercise is where you do the bow really fast each direction. Okay. And you can do it on all four strings. Okay. So not just the D string and focus on the sound and making sure that it has a good sound all the time. Okay. Great. Um, and then one more exercise that will help you um, because there's so many times when you have to cross the string in this piece is to practice your string crossings. And it's the same idea where you want to get a very consistent sound and something that doesn't go fuzzy and doesn't go scratchy. Okay, so you can practice each string crossing. This is again without the left hand at all. So listen once to the string crossings that I do. You can make up your own pattern, but this is the pattern that I like to do. try a pattern. You can make up your own. It doesn't matter. You can't remember the one I did. Dia, I'm impressed. I, I don't know many people that can memorize 24 notes after hearing them only once. That was really great. Um, great. So you can do that at the frog. You can use the whole bow or you can use just the tip to practice. 
Um, and I know I'm giving you a lot of different exercises that aren't um, the music that you're working on, but it's kind of like brushing your teeth, okay? So the more of these exercises you do, the better cello hygiene you will have. So the um, cleaner your sound will be. Um, and what we're trying to get is a really, really clean sound, okay? Uh, I, I think that I don't need to repeat any of that because you've picked up on things so quickly. Um, and it's really nice to hear you play. Um, good luck. And I, I hope you learn the entire first suite. That would be really cool. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Everyone, let's clap for Dia. Great job, Dia. Um, well, thank you to everyone who's played and thank you, Jeremy, so much for all the wonderful tips and, and great exercises. And, and I really think all of these, all of these tricks and tips work for everyone at any level of playing. We do have one question from the comments on the live stream um, that it was whether you maybe have any other uh, left hand exercises for addressing tension in the left hand, particularly um, particularly maybe the top of the hand, but, but, but the thumb possibly too, but more on the top of the hand. The vibrato one certainly would help, but do you have any other? You've got so many nice tricks of the trade. Is there anything else you might throw out there? Yeah, thanks. That's a, a really great question. Um, I do a number of exercises. Some of them are more complicated than others. And uh, it kind of mixes everything together. So um, sometimes I'm working on intonation, but also thinking about relaxing the hand. I like to practice fourths a lot uh, because that what that does is that helps solidify your hand position. When you're doing fourths, um, you see all the fingers are really um, curled rather than scrunched. Um, so that's a useful one or doing major sixths. Um, and the ghosting really helps me. So the vibrato thing where you're not pressing down much. Another thing you can do is ghosting where um, you literally don't press at all and you're just barely touching the string. And you can do this where the thumb is off the fingerboard or where it's barely on the neck of the cello, but not pressing. So what I do is three layers of this ghosting. One of them is where I'm just touching the strings, but have 0% pressure. And so it's like using artificial harmonics. Um, it sounds really bad. A lot of these exercises sound really bad, but um, no one's listening when you're practicing at home, I hope, except maybe a few cats and that, that can be a disaster, but it sounds like this. So I'm gonna play the elegy with no pressure at all. <laughs> And I'm sure Zoom made that sound amazing. Um, then the second one is to add 50% pressure. So you're pushing the string down a little bit, but you're not quite pushing it all the way to the fingerboard. And you want to keep the bow at full pressure for all three of these. Oh, <laughs> Jeff said beautiful. So this is with 50% pressure. Also, I'm sure it sounded great. And then the third one is to use full pressure. So 100% pressing the string down, but only as much as you need. So you don't want to push the string too hard into the instrument. Uh, the reason why I practice this way is because a lot of, a lot of us, I think, we clamp down, we put too much pressure with our fingers. And so as a result, we also have to use pressure with our thumb. And whenever you're using pressure with your thumb, you're just negating the pressure you're using with your fingers. So it's a net zero um, output of energy. You're inputting all of this energy, but it's having absolutely no effect. So if you can press 100% with your fingers and 0% with your thumb, then you're being as efficient as you can with your hand and that will allow you to be able to relax your hand. So 100% pressure of course sounds just normal. But hopefully you're not pressing any more than you need to. 
Great. Did you ever have uh, any problems or, or students who you helped work with who, whose, whose fingers tended to collapse while doing that, while putting pressure, like a double, the, the, the old double jointed issue? Yeah, um, I think 90% of my students think that they're double jointed and probably 10% of them are. I can't remember the ratio of who's double jointed or a lot of people may start double jointed. Um, the more that you practice having your fingers curled, the stronger those tiny muscles become. Um, the, the best technique that I can give you for that um, is uh, you use your elbow weight to pull the string down. So imagine yourself hanging on to a cliff for dear life, right? And your elbow weight is what's pushing the string down rather than using your fingers to push the string down. If you are collapsing your finger, chances are you're trying to press with your index finger or with, with your other fingers really hard. But if you're just using your elbow to pull the string like this, then um, you're, knuckles will not collapse. Um, you need to do all of this work as slowly as you can and work on it a lot. And I guarantee you, it's just like lifting weights after three or four weeks of doing push-ups and stuff, you're gonna see the huge muscles grow over here. It's the same with your fingers. After three or four weeks of doing these exercises with your fingers where you're not doing that and you're using the weight of your elbow to pull down the string, then I guarantee you they're going to look really buff. They're going to feel extremely buff and um, you'll never do this again. That's great. And if there's any violin players listening, it's the same thing I tell my students. It's, you, it's like you're hanging from the fingerboard, you know, rather than, rather than just like pressing. So that's, um, that's fabulous. You've given such a wonderful range of um, things to consider uh, this, this session. So, um, thank you so much. And I think that is just about a wrap on this afternoon's masterclass. Yeah, thank you everyone for playing. Um, you sound great. And I hope I can meet all of you at some point in real life. Um, many of you may know I was in the youth orchestra for one year in 2002 and then, or 2003. And then I was in the Arkansas Symphony in 2004 for four years before I moved to Michigan. So it'll be nice to come back someday. Go ahead. Yeah, and um, and Jeremy is also a composer and the Arkansas Symphony will be performing one of Jeremy's compositions for the first time uh, this coming season. So we're excited about that too. So check out the calendar. Yeah, I'm hoping to come to that show too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. So um, great. Well, thank you everybody. I think I'm going to um, go ahead and log off. I'm going to finish the live, um, finish the live stream first, and then, um, and then end the, um, and then end the video. So thank you all again. Hope to see you soon. And, and um, great job, everyone. Bye.